very much. And for those of you that are standing in the back, there's plenty of seat. No, sorry. The, uh, so I'm a, I'm a professor of meteorology at Millersville University in Pennsylvania. I've been there for 14 years. And I'm going to talk about our scientific computing requirements in our undergraduate meteorology curriculum. Uh, my outline is I'm going to talk about the American Meteorological Society guidelines, uh, scientific computing courses that we have in our program, why we teach Fortran and Python instead of other languages, and then a little details of the Python course that I teach and the numerical modeling course that I teach. I'll discuss some issues that I have with teaching and using Python, and then also talk about uh, Python use outside of the classroom. So the AMS, the American Meteorological Society, is our professional organization, and they they provide curriculum guidelines for what a degree, a bachelor's degree in meteorology or atmospheric sciences should consist of. And these guidelines uh, are, go along with the federal civil service guidelines for employment as a meteorologist. And specifically, I want to focus on their guideline for competency in scientific computing, the American Meteorological Society guidelines. These are verbatim out of their document that students should have experience using a high level structured programming language and the specific examples that they use are C, C++, Python, MATLAB, IDL, or Fortran. And then the ability to apply numerical and statistical methods to atmospheric science problems. So the way we do that in our curriculum, uh, we have several courses, a required Fortran course for all our students at the junior year. And yes, Fortran is alive and well. Um, and then we also have a Python class that is a follow-on that is an optional. The students after the Fortran class either need to take the Python class or a class we have in GIS, depending on whether they want to go more into the, the numerical side of things or if they're going into broadcasting or going to work for AccuWeather, then we might recommend they take the GIS class that might be, although a, a significant number of students actually take both, even though they're only required to take one. And then we also have an optional course that I developed that's numerical modeling of the atmosphere and the oceans. So why Fortran? Um, well, it is still the primary language for large-scale scientific com computing. Most of the weather prediction models that are being run on the supercomputers at NCAR and at NCEP and in Europe are still written in Fortran. And our computer science department won't teach a Fortran course. They won't touch it with a 10-foot pole with a rubber glove tied on the end. So we have to teach it ourselves within our department. And then, uh, but the Fortran experience has actually gotten our graduates jobs. People are impressed when they see, oh, you, you actually know Fortran. It's, it's still in use. Why Python? Uh, the follow-on course up until 2011 had actually been taught in IDL. And that class was successful for numerous students who went on to graduate school or went on to uh, work with NASA. It served them very well, however, most students who took the IDL course were never going to see it again, basically. It has such a small footprint. Um, it's, uh, a lot of them were going to go to places that didn't have IDL licenses. So it kind of felt guilty putting the students through this IDL course when most of them were never going to see it again. So we switched the class to Python and the IDL class to Python because Python is open source, non-proprietary. It's easy to learn and use. It's more intuitive has growing popularity in the atmospheric and ocean sciences community and has extensive useful libraries. So a little bit about the Python course that I teach. It does assume basic programming knowledge in some language since it is the follow-on course. So most of our students have had Fortran. We do allow if a student transfers in from another university or from another program or if they're also working on a computer science minor, we'll let them substitute the Java or C++ experience for the Fortran. So most of the students in my Python course have had Fortran, but some of them come in with other languages. The goal is to use Python for data visualization and analysis. And I don't use a textbook. I use my online course notes and documentation from the web. Here's an outline of the Python course that we teach. These topics on the left here are kind of the introduction and the basics of getting the students used to program control and syntax, strings, uh, reading and writing files, 
regular expressions, writing functions, methods, and modules, and a little introduction to classes. And then on the right hand side here is where we have uh, kind of the, the nuts and bolts of the analysis and plotting. We teach them how to do the, the 1 and 2D graphs, how to read NetCDF files. NetCDF is a very important data format in the atmospheric sciences using base map. And uh, we try to do some spectral analysis and some linear algebra as well. So an example of some of the assignments that the students in the Python course will do, we try to make them relevant to their other uh, atmospheric science classes that they had. So one example is uh, a METAR decoder. METAR is the code that the weather observations are from around the world are coded in for transmission, particularly for aviation use. It's very cryptic code. Every one of these is a weather observation from an airfield somewhere. So it's a nice little project. It just screams for regular expressions. So this is where they will write a decoder to search through this file with thousands of these in here and identify the, the right station and then decode it and print it out in more of a plain English format. So that's an example of one of the assignments we do with them. Uh, we also teach them plotting curves and I like to use again examples out of their prior classes so we'll plot the black body radiation curves for the sun and for the earth on the same set of uh, wavelength axes and have them mark in the uh, visible spectrum in this magic four microns which is where we in meteorology cut off between short wave or solar radiation and long wave or terrestrial radiation or we'll have them from the ideal gas law plot a pressure volume temperature diagram with pressure and volume as the axes and then color code in the, uh, the temperature. So for the plotting we try to again make it relevant to their other courses. I like to use it to reinforce concepts that I've taught them in other courses so they're not escaping it. They're getting both the programming in and the content of the, the science in there. And then some other things. We, we do some 3D uh, which I'll do as an example here. So this is an assignment that they'll do to make a three-dimensional rendering of, this is the Ekman spiral in the oceans where the ocean current, the surface current, will be going in one direction but as you go deeper in the ocean the current actually spirals to the to the right in the northern hemisphere and decreases. So you get this spiral. That's why when the uh, they noticed the, the Arctic explorers that when the wind was blowing objects didn't blow directly downwind long term. They would go 45 degrees to the right of the wind and then the, the upper surface of the ocean itself would, would uh, the net transport would be 90 degrees to the right of the wind due to this Ekman spiral. So they, teach, they learn about it in the class but then I like to make them write a program to plot it in my Python course so they can uh, get more used to that. Another assignment that I really like that I think helps them a lot is visualizing contours and surfaces because when they're looking at a, at a meteorology map they're used to seeing contours like this but I like to reinforce that really what they're looking at is a pressure surface and the topography of a pressure surface so by doing these 3D renderings forcing them to, to do this it will again reinforce stuff that they've learned in their prior meteorology classes. If I can get back to my slideshow here. Now for the numerical modeling course that I teach, this one is a combination of theory and programming exercises. And this one I don't specify that they have to use Python. They can program their models in any language that they're comfortable with. Although I tell them I can really only help them if they do it in a language that I know, which would be Fortran or IDL or Python. And most of them do use Python just because they see how easy it is to do it in Python. So all the students will program numerical solutions to uh, the one-dimensional advection equation, and then a two-dimensional shallow water model with rotation of the Earth included, and a 2D uh, quasi-geostrophic barotropic model. So as an example of something that they might do, the, the most simplest exercise they'll do is this is the one-dimensional advection equation or also known as the one-way wave equation. And solutions to this are just supposed to propagate, maintain their shape and amplitude and propagate at this speed c. 
So for finite differencing, there's various ways you can represent these time and spatial derivatives. So here's just two different methods right here showing the the forward in time, backward in space, or centered in time, centered in space. But the students will write the, the code for this in Python, and then they can see how the how same equation but different representations for finite differencing, the solution will behave differently. And there, there are other solutions that they can write for this as well. So uh, it really helps them. I mean, I could just give them these diagrams and tell them this is what these solutions do, but by making them write the programs, uh, I think it's a lot more meaningful to them when they see and they can play with their own program and, and play with the parameters. Now, I, based on some of the earlier talks in this conference, I got to thinking, you know, for my modeling class, yes, I, I Python notebooks would probably uh, lend themselves well to this type. Uh, the, the thing I struggle with a little bit is if I, for, if I do the IPython notebooks in my class, uh, then they might lose the choice as to what language that they could actually do their homeworks in. And I struggle with that a little bit. You know, do I give them the choice or do I force them to use Python? So I still have to think about that. If anybody has any ideas for that, I'd welcome suggestions. Yes. Oh, what about Fortran or MATLAB or yeah. can you? See, and, and this is where I show my ignorance, I guess, of IPython notebooks, so, yeah. Well, it's, there's a MATLAB Magix for IPython. I mean, it's not as beautiful, it's just writing Python or maybe right. or any of the other kernels. Yeah. And then there's part of me that says, hey, why not force them to write Python, because that's what I like. You know? Since I started writing Python code, my hope is to never write any, in anything else ever again. But, so I don't know. We'll have to. But that's good to know that I can use it. If I do use the IPython notebooks, I can use it for other languages. Okay. Magics. So some issues that I've faced using and teaching Python are, uh, I'll talk about these a little more in depth, so I'll give you the list now. Which installation to use, which Python installation. There is confusion if there's multiple installations on a machine. How to do animations. Keeping up with newer packages such as animations and three-dimensional plots. And integration of Python into other courses in the curriculum. So which Python package to use? We have been using the Enthought Python distribution because it was nice and self-contained. The dependencies were worked out. And then they went and switched to Canopy. And I was like, oh man, I just learned all this. Now I have to learn Canopy. Uh, but in spring of 2014, this past spring, we did install both Canopy and EPD on all our lab computers and gave the students the choice. And uh, uh, so it was... About a third of them used Canopy and two thirds were still using EPD, but the Canopy worked out very well. So I'm thinking in future offerings, we may just remove the EPD and have the Canopy as our default Python installation on our, our lab computers. Now, as far as having multiple Python installations, uh, ArcGIS also installs Python and we have ArcGIS on all our lab computers. And, this was confusing at first because I would have the students open Python and the ArcGIS version of Python turned into the default and so they'd open it and I'd be trying to show them stuff and this library's not there and this isn't working and it took a while to realize what was happening so you know, I had to make sure that they open up the proper Python distribution. Of course, if we go to Canopy, I don't think that will be an issue. Animations were, were kind of tricky for me because in IDL, there's a poor man's method of animating where you just put your plot in a loop and have a pause statement that requires a, a carriage return. And so you could load it up and just hold down the, the enter key and it would animate for you. And I haven't seen anything like that in Python. So you know, there's a couple of workarounds. One is just to create a whole series of of images and then stitch them together in an animated GIF like we see here. But that's kind of cumbersome because you've got to create all the separate um, images first and do this and then they've got to do an external command with the, with the 
You basically have to name all your plots with a separate sequential number and then use this convert command to, to loop them. Another thing that I've done is I like messing around with uh, GUIs and, and tkinter, so I did build my own um, very crude GUI where I can give this to the students, they save their files, the, the, the output files in a certain format and I give them this GUI and they can interactively query them for the file and it will input it and then just use this crude slider to, to show their animations. I was really hoping that there would be some sort of very easy animation though with a, a dwell and, and pause button. Yes, I have, and I've tried it. I haven't tried it recently, but it seemed kind of cumbersome, and the documentation I found very lacking for how to use it. The latter I'll take away for, um, but we should talk afterwards. Uh, yeah, I, I'll go yes, I would, I would love to be able to, to do something more than my, uh, my crude GUI here. And I know when I ever people see a GUI in TK, I feel like I've uh, you know driven to the classic car show in an Edsel or something, or a, or a 63 Nash Rambler, because people make fun of me. Um, keeping up with newer packages, again, like the, the 3D plot or animations, if, if something is on the cutting edge and has changed, and it hasn't been incorporated in our lab computers, but I've downloaded it on my office computer, so I think, oh, this works great, and then I try to show the students, and it doesn't work, so that can be an issue. It creates a frustration factor. Um, uses of Python outside of formal courses. Uh, although we teach Python and use it in our courses, uh, many of the students like it and use it for their research projects and other courses. And I know this because they're always coming to my office bugging me saying, can you help me write this program for this research project for this other class? Which I don't mind because it, it shows me that they're actually using what I'm teaching them. So some examples, uh, we have a, a radio sound system, a Weissler radio sound system, and it saves the data in a certain format. And so a student and I built, well I built a skew T or plotting program which takes the data files and gives us an atmospheric profile um, something like this. So this is the output of this QT uh, program that I wrote. And then when Vaisala changed their format for the output from the instrument, one of my students was actually able to take my code and instead of me rewriting it for the new format, he did it himself. So that's always nice when they become autonomous and, and can work like that. Especially because these are, these are uh, uh, undergraduates and it's really nice when you see undergraduates take on these responsibilities and are able to, to uh, do things like that. Another example is uh, data from our flux tower which takes measurements 10 times a second. The student needed one minute averages for a lot of large data files so he wrote a Python program with my help that would, uh, that would convert it into one minute averages. And then for my own use, uh, I'll finish up showing a couple of, uh, you know, when I'm making homework assignments in thermodynamics or my atmospheric dynamics class, there's a lot of calculations that are tedious. I want to get numbers that are reasonable for the students to use for their assignments, but I don't want to have to crank through all the equations again just to come up with representative numbers. So I built uh, a thermodynamic calculator, again using TK, that allows me to enter the pressure and temperature and relative humidity with a slider and it will calculate all the other thermodynamic variables for me and I can, I can change the units in Celsius or, or inches of mercury or hectopascals and if I want to use uh, sea level pressure instead of station pressure I can dial in a sea level pressure and change the altitude and it will do this on the fly for me. So I like to write code that will make my life easier and I do the same thing with my wind calculator where I can give a latitude and a, and a contour interval and a contour spacing and curvature and it will calculate the geostrophic and, psych and uh, gradient winds for me. So, shameless plug, um, I recently published a book on atmospheric numerical modeling through uh, Sundog Publishing and every figure in the book, including these cute little globes on the cover here, and every figure in the book, with a few exceptions, I generated with Python and uh, Matplotlib. 
And here's a link to my uh, Python course notes in case anybody is interested in that. And I'll take any questions. Yes. For the shallow water, yes, yeah, we, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not as fat. The thing is, you know, I'm doing it in an education setting, uh, so I think for showing students what is under the hood of the model and how it works, Python is fine. If I were writing something that needed to be fast or operational, I, you know, I probably wouldn't write it in Python, but. <laughs> yeah, the most I've done with the Python itself was a 2D model. I haven't done a, any 3D model. And that, that was one thing that I was kind of surprised at. I knew Python would be slower. This last iteration of my numerical modeling course, um, 15 students used Python, two used Fortran, and one used MATLAB. And I thought MATLAB would be on par with Python as far as slowness, but the student who used MATLAB, MATLAB, his code ran pretty darn fast. You know, almost, I don't, it wasn't as fast as the Fortran, but it was a lot faster than the Python. So that is one drawback with, with modeling with Python. You're not going to write an operational model with it. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I do skew T labs in my courses, but not, but not with Python. Uh, but if you're, I do have online course notes for all my courses, including my thermodynamics course. So I can give you the the URL, and and, and if you contact me, I can even give you copies of of assignments and stuff that you can take and modify if you're interested. Yes. Um, other questions. Thank you.